Good evening and welcome to our final Tisky Sour on a Friday night in full lockdown. I mean, not everything is going to be open from next week, but you will be able um, to sit outside with six people potentially in a garden. Of course, that will be no excuse not to tune into next week's Tisky Sour. I'm delighted to be joined tonight by Aaron Bastani. How are you doing? I'm very well, Michael. How are you doing? Uh, yeah, I'm very well. I'm feeling like, you know, we're, we're coming out of this, aren't we? Um, we're not going to talk much about coronavirus this evening. Um, we've, we've, we've done enough of that. But yeah, in, in this country, at least, it seems like it's going well. Over in Europe, they're having some problems, which is why we should probably increase travel restrictions. But we've talked about that before. Tonight, um, we're going to talk to you about the ship blocking the Suez Canal, the effect of the policing bill on Gypsy, Roma and Traveller communities, and Ed Miliband's electric car revolution. I also speak to Sean Fay about a court ruling on trans healthcare. Um, that's actually some some good news um, for you, which which makes a change on that particular issue. Um, as ever, if you'd like to let us know your opinions on any of the topics we are talking about tonight, you can get in touch by tweeting on the hashtag Tisky Sour, as well as putting your comments in the super chats or the comments under the Twitch stream. Now, it's a common sight to see a truck or van block an urban street. It struggles to reverse to turn a corner and you get a backlog of cars and buses with drivers and passengers growing increasingly irate. This week in the Middle East, the world has watched a similar phenomenon. Only this time, instead of a truck, it's a 200,000 ton, 400 meter long container ship. And instead of a backlog of irate drivers, it's blocking 12% of global trade. This is the ever given. And since Wednesday, it's been blocking the Suez Canal. Um, you can see a bird's eye view of it there. Now, many of you will know where the Suez Canal is. Just in case you don't, let's get up a map to show why this is such a significant place to get a boat stuck. Um, so this is very zoomed out. You're looking at the north or square in, in that square is the north of Egypt, right where the Middle East connects to Africa. And if we zoom in a little bit closer, you can see that's where the Suez Canal is, which is the connection between the Mediterranean Sea to its north and the Indian Ocean to its southeast. Um, you know, the fact that it connects um, Europe with, with Asia is the reason why it's such a bottleneck for trade. Um, according to the Suez Canal Authority, an average of 51.5 ships per day pass through the canal. And these, are, you know, these are mega container ships. Um, they're, they're all a, a big deal. And uh, we can tell that because the shipping data and news company Lloyd's List has valued the canal's westbound traffic at roughly $5.1 billion a day and the eastbound traffic at around $4.5 billion a day. Um, satellite imagery has been showing us many of these ships, which are loaded with millions of pounds worth of goods, um, all clogged up at either end of the canal. This is um, the southern terminus. You can see there are a bunch of ships. These are all available on online. You can basically watch live um, the larger ships and, and where they currently are. And we can see them queuing up on the other side. So this is the north of that canal in the Mediterranean Sea. Now, as you can see there, lots of ships are waiting. Um, many of them have been diverted, which means they have to go all the way around the Horn of Africa and the Cape of Good Hope, which can add an additional seven to nine days to a trip. And time is, of course, money. Now, Aaron, most of the social media commentary on, on the ship getting stuck is focused on how awkward it would be to be the captain of that ship. But does this phenomenon tell us anything interesting about modern global capitalism? Well, I think it does, Michael, yeah. I mean, often when, when we talk about contemporary capitalism, we talk about two things. We talk about production and we talk about consumption. Uh, and of course, those are both very important uh, in terms of what capitalism looks like and how you see forms of, of resistance. Now, historically, it's been through production, whether that's, you know, worker occupations, industrial action, go slow. We, 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 we know the various repertoires of protests with industrial action. You've got some with consumption, consumer boycotts, uh, less powerful historically, but ethical consumption, you know, a point of consumption in terms of changing production is, is again, widely recognized. Something less talked about is circulation. Now, circulation is just as important to capitalism on a global scale, particularly as production and consumption. And the inhibition, the slowing down of circulation is a, is a major potential problem. And this is just one one chokehold, as you as you rightly put it, you know there are many others. The Straits of Hormuz between the UAE and Iran uh, is 
is basically the passage through which around I think two thirds of global hydrocarbons pass through. So not just oil, but also gas. Uh, it's again a huge choke point, Saudi Arabia. And for some reason that was closed off, the world very quickly would see rapidly rising prices for fossil fuels. Uh, and again, similarly with the Suez Canal, if you were to have it permanently blocked off, not happening anytime soon. But that, of course, was why there was a war uh, between uh, the Egyptians against the Israelis, French and, and, and the Brits over Suez in the early 1950s. Again, it's very strategically important from an economic standpoint. So the fact it's closed for one or two days, yes, it caused problems. I'm sure it'll be, it'll be rectified incredibly quickly. But what that tells you is something really, really important, which is while wherever you're watching this, you might be in LA, you might be in Basingstoke, you might be in Auckland in New Zealand, you might be in Swindon, Dundee, Belfast, doesn't matter. Generally speaking, it feels like our economic system is quite stable and reliable and calm and predictable. But even just this little thing in the Suez Canal can really upset a lot of people, the, you know, the distribution of certain goods to a significant extent. And so I think what it does is it allows us to have a broader conversation around, well, okay, if we see, you know, significant disruption to food supplies or fresh water supplies, or if there's a major geopolitical conflict involving China or Iran, what does that look like? And it makes you realize that actually this kind of ideological glaze you see over the top of capitalism, underneath it is a great deal of potential antagonism, conflict, uh, disruption. Uh, and so, yes, of course, just, just this thing in isolation doesn't mean very much. But I think it's important to say it reflects something far more important, which is uh, that point of circulation and that point of actually this economic social system we take for granted, which we think is incredibly stable as anything but. Mm. No, I mean, exactly that. There are these very small choke points which can cause real chaos. I mean, again, probably not so much because this was accidental, but if there were a more long-term geopolitical conflict in, in that area, which has caused wars beforehand. Now, you do you, you keep saying it's going to be sorted quite quickly. To be honest, we don't know. Um, from what I can tell, it looks quite difficult to get this big ship out of that small canal. First of all, I want to point out why it seems um, that this ship has got stuck. Obviously, that canal has been there for a long time. There have been ships going through it for a long time. Um, and whilst it has been blocked for geopolitical reasons, as far as um, I understand, it's never been blocked because a ship turned sideways and then couldn't be removed. And it seems to me that the big issue here isn't, it's not that climate change has made the canal any shallower. It's not that the wind has got any stronger. It's that the ships have got a lot bigger. And I didn't realise how how much bigger. This is quite a dramatic um, transformation. And um, this is a graph from the FT, I'm originally from Ghent University, in fact, which is showing you how um, ships have got much bigger over time. So if we just go into the recent past, in 2007, the biggest container ships carried 8,000 containers, showing you containers on the on the y-axis there. Um, now, some ships already are close to 25,000 containers. Mm. So you can see they've, they've quadrupled, um, not quadrupled, sorry, tripled in size over a 13-year period. Now, the Ever, Give, the Ever Given, which has caused that blockage, um, was finished in 2018 and carries just over 20,000 containers. So it's over double the size of the biggest ship in 2017, and the canal hasn't got any bigger. We can go through quickly now how they might get it out because it does seem like a big challenge. Um, there's some good graphics from the BBC here showing how how one gets out a 400 meter long, 200,000 ton ship um, when it's beached um, across a canal. Um, so this is how it might be moved. Um, you've got tugboats trying to pull it because obviously it's, it's almost horizontal. They want to get it horizontal compared or perpendicular I suppose to the canal they want to get it straight so it can move down you've got tugs pushing and pulling it um, but you know, not having much success at this point in time and then you've got a digger which is trying to I suppose extend the canal slightly so that the the ship can be can be widened it slightly so the ship can be moved outside and for for a sort of notion of the size difference this is the image which has really been going viral which is sort of the, the pathetic um, image of that tiny tiny digger trying to get out this mammoth gargantuan ship um, as well as pulling and digging um, you also have ships which are dredging um, which is trying to pull out dirt from directly underneath that ship so that it can be moved so it's no longer um, beached on on the side of the the canal something else i didn't realize you, we assume it's going to get better it could get worse because if they can't move it if it's too heavy 
they might end up having they might end up having to take some of the containers off that ship. Now, something I didn't realize is that if you take the containers off in slightly the wrong order, and you can imagine that happening because you can't, you know, normally you have a very specific um, place where the ship can land or embark, and then you take the containers off in sort of a methodical way. Here, if you just have to take them off at the point which is closest to the land, then you could end up destabilizing the ship. Worst case scenario, apparently, it splits in half. You could be looking at a Titanic um, situation. I assume there's a lot of engineers who are going to be doing the maths to make sure that doesn't happen, but it's it's not necessarily going to be that easy to uh, to move this thing. Aaron, do you think this will change anything? Do you think at this point in time there might be you know the 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 godfathers of global capitalism saying like this is a little bit unsustainable? Obviously, they've put all of this fixed capital into these huge ships. I don't mm. think anyone's now just going to say, oh, the ship's got too big let's dump them. They only built it in 2018. It's going to be worth millions of pounds. Um, what can they do to, to stop this happening in the future? Well, there's a few things to think about here, Michael. So what you say about the sort of increased in size of, of container ships is, is a really good point. And of course, one of the sort of fundamental technologies for contemporary globalization is containerization. You know, again, it's that that veneer. We think of everything so calm and so placid and cheap consumer durables from all around the world. A great deal of technological innovation, political kind of uh, decision making, so on. It makes that all possible. Again, it's the, the, the real meaning of ideology is to think that this is all normal and common sense and it's always been like this, when in fact, actually, it's a set of contingent decisions and outcomes and contestations. Sorry to use kind of Marxist language, but that's kind of that's kind of how we would talk about it. Now, I, as I said at the, at, the, at the top of this, circulation is as important as production and consumption, and hence, Capitalists, people trying to make money out of money, i.e. capital, um, which is what all the capital is. If people say, what's capital? Capital is money that makes money. It's money. It's it's, it's what you would call um, uh, value in circulation. So to make uh, money, you deploy some money, you get some uh, fixed capital, i.e. machines, you get some variable capital, i.e. people, you get the surplus value from those people to create profit. That's marks on, on capitalism. Circulation is an important way of increasing profit because you can circulate more of a particular good. Often you want to do it more quickly. You want to do it in greater volumes. If you can do both at the same time, great. Uh, and this is a classic example of that. So there's a reason why people are doing it. It's not because, you know, uh, there's a sort of challenge to see who can, you know, build the biggest container ship. It's about making profit. Now, in the background of all of this, of course, is the Belt and Road Initiative by the, the Chinese state. And there will be a lot more cargo freight in the coming decades that's being transported by train. That that will be a thing, uh, but it it probably you know won't really be so big that we won't see more of these container ships. And I think ultimately what you'll see now is a, is a is a debate. I mean, it's not really a debate because it's a tiny you know it's a tiny group within the capitalist interest of sort of you know maritime <laughs> distribution and logistics. But they will say well, we probably need to expand the Suez Canal. It's not big enough. Uh, but then, of course, you have broader conversations to be had. Okay, well, what about the Panama Canal? You know, what about you know? The, again, how do you secure the Straits of Hormuz? These are constant decisions and conversations that the capitalist class have to have. Uh, and, and, and what it means is, what does a, a sustainable capitalism look like? Well, that's a very good question. If you're trying to live within our planet's biocapacity and its limits. Because fundamentally, if you've got people in competition win with one another trying to make profit, that constantly means innovation. That constantly means quicker, more voluminous circulation. It means trying to produce more and more with less and less, replete with crises. And, and this is a great example of it. If we want to live uh, in a world which is sustainable, we want to live within our plant's biocapacity, the Suez Canal should not be getting any bigger, right? Just like we shouldn't be drilling for any more oil in the North Sea. Both are going to happen because it's making profit for someone. Mm. And I, I saw a, a really interesting tweet about this, which was saying that one of the big benefits of renewable energy that we never talk about is the fact that you don't have to move it. So it's not just that you're not burning fossil fuels. You're also got the you got the energy on your doorstep. So if we were as reliant on oil as we once were, this could potentially be causing chaos. But, you know, we've got a, a very much a diversified energy system which means that you know i mean there's not going to be shortages anytime soon can i come back on that of course you know and also it was something it was one of the defenses you know god every every show either not keir starmer or the european union or both uh, but this was in the whole debate around britain's membership of the european union a lot of 
seemingly good leftists were saying oh, globalization in itself is a good thing. It's really good that we're you know having goods produced and manufactured in Bangladesh, Vietnam, India, China, Indonesia, and we get them over here. That somehow is a sign of progress. Don't ask me why. Uh, but realistically, again, if we're talking about living within our planetary constraints, no, goods should be produced as close to the end consumers as possible, really. Uh, and again, there's an argument there around reshoring. Again, it's within a particular subset of the capitalist interest. But this idea that globalization, progressive values, liberal values, you know, it's good that we are having stuff brought in from the other side of the planet on container ships burning hydrocarbons, which are increasing CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere and thus killing the planet is crazy. Please think think sensibly. Stop saying this garbage. Uh, it does help development. It does. I mean, trade trade is 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 good for development oh, of the global it, south. It helps. It help, it help, it help. Well, it it can help development. Depends. You know, there's the, there's a conversation around the commodity curse and so on. Exports of oil from the global south don't tend to do particularly well. But in any case, you're right. There are clearly major upsides to it. But the idea that in and of itself, it's a progressive liberal thing uh, that we are getting kids' toys produced in Vietnam and brought here with fossil fuels is obviously absurd. Um, in the Twitch chat, Scrider has uh, a comparison about the size of the ship. He says it's the size of three football pitches. I actually read four football pitches. I have to admit, I don't quite know how long a football pitch is. Is it 100 meters or a little bit longer? Um, I'll have a chance to look during the next story. Last December, England's High Court ruled that people under 16 could not consent to the use of puberty blockers in making their decision. The judges sided with Kira Bell, aged 23, who had been prescribed puberty blockers by Tavistock Centre in London, aged 16, but had since come to believe her treatment was a mistake. Now, the ruling led the Tavistock Centre, which is the UK's only gender identity development service in the UK, um, to stop prescribing puberty block blockers to under 16s, and was seen by many as a huge blow to the right of trans or the right to trans healthcare. Now, that of course makes sense if dysphoria leads to people to want to stall puberty, waiting until one is 16 rather defeats the point. So this was treated as a really serious, serious blow at the time. However, this morning there was a separate um, decision which has really ameliorated um, that initial one. Um, that's because a, a court has has now ruled um, that you can get these blockers if your parents consent. Now to discuss the significance of the case I spoke to Sean Fay, writer, broadcaster and author of the forthcoming The Transgender Issue that will be released with Penguin. I started by asking her why access to puberty blockers are so important to trans people. The reason that puberty blockers are important to trans people, particularly trans young people, is that they're the first possible option, the earliest possible medical intervention you can have to treat gender dysphoria, i.e. Um, distress with one's physical sex characteristics. So in the case of trans children who have come out young, maybe socially transitioned, i.e. they've changed their name, their pronouns, they live as a gender different to the one they were assigned at birth, perhaps in primary school, is the knowledge that as puberty is coming, um, that they will start to develop with their endogenous puberty, with their natural sex hormones, um, sex characteristics irrevocably that um, will cause them more distress because they don't align or match up with the gender they're living in. And often trans kids who come out younger will know that this is coming and be distressed. Sometimes trans kids only, re you know, because kids, it depends on how much you know about puberty, um, will only start to realize it as their puberty begins, that they actually feel pretty dysphoric about it. So puberty blockers are the first possible intervention for people who have acute gender dysphoria. This is not like necessarily all trans young people or gender non-conforming young people. It's for the young people who probably feel the most distress. Uh, and puberty blockers are a drug which are you have been used um, in a condition called precocious puberty, um, in which like young girls sometimes just because of a natural variation can start menstruation early, and that can be distressing because they're out of step with their peers. It can also cause restricted height in youth. Um, it pauses their puberty, and that's been used in yeah in cisgender children for for precocious puberty since the seventies. It's been used for trans children since about the nineties um, in the UK, and. Yeah, the, the way that the drug acts is it essentially blocks the release of the sex hormones um, that would happen during puberty, um, as long as you're taking the drug. Um, if you stop taking the drug, the sex hormones would um, kick back in and essentially your natural puberty would resume. So there's a debate about whether or not what people mean when they say reversible, but in, in the sense that 
it doesn't cause any permanent changes to the body. It actually prevents permanent changes to the body. So that's the first thing, the earliest intervention a trans young person can have. And there's two sort of purposes of that. One, it alleviates gender dysphoria um, and stops irrevocable changes of puberty becoming. The other thing is it kind of buys time in some cases. So it gives you more time to think about you know, if you're feeling dysphoric, is it that you want to transition ultimately? Is it that you want to um, go on to cross sex hormones, which are, is where uh, more kind of long term and permanent changes would happen? So talking about where we are right now in terms of the legal situation, if we put together the ruling in December and the ruling today, it's now the case that a child can access puberty blockers if their parents believe they should have it. So the consent of the child seems to have gone out the window and it's now up to the parents. Does that make much practical difference compared to where we were beforehand? I presume it was quite difficult to get this treatment if your parents weren't on side anyway. Yeah, that, that's right. On a practical level, I would say in Britain, it was nigh on impossible <laughs> to access any kind of um, medical transition um, unless you were self-medicating, like ordering hormones off the internet, which a lot of young people are doing. Um, at, but unless you were doing that behind your parents back if you were doing it like you know under the care of a doctor as which is obviously what's recommended um there would be no way because the uh the, the psychologists psychiatrists who become clinicians at the gender identity development service at the tavistock clinic in london which has a monopoly on access to healthcare for trans youth in in england and wales they're just they just wouldn't they would be very wary of treating anyone the, whose parents weren't on board. Also, it's the fact that you have to go to, you know, if you're not from London, you have to get to London for meetings, um, for, for sessions, um, the, the kind of therapeutic sessions that you have. Like, it's just practically not possible without a huge amount of parental support. I think there might be some parents who are somewhere in the middle. They all, they'll, they go through the whole process, but it doesn't mean that they're fully supportive of their child's identity. It just means that they're sort of willing to go to the process. So there are perhaps some in the middle. Um, but yeah, on the whole, practically, it 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 kind of restores us perhaps to the position that we were in before the uh, judgment in December. Of course, there's a there's a difference between talking about the practicalities and talking about what's desirable, and there's still a fundamental issue I think in in the the um, jurisprudence, the legal decision making around puberty blockers is that the high court in England and Wales seems to be very fixed on the idea that puberty blockers are this very unique special treatment that aren't like any other treatment given to young people which I would disagree with uh, and it shouldn't be viewed in those specialist terms um, and it seems to flow from this idea that yeah it seems that most well I think the evidence shows that like, almost all kids that go on puberty blockers I think all kids basically who go on puberty blockers end up cro going on to cross-sex hormones I would say a lot of trans health advocates would say that's because the right kids are getting treated and because like they're so dysphoric that obviously they're going to go on to transition. So it's actually a good sign. Obviously, what some people um, perceive, including some judges, is that this might be a more like a gateway drug situation. And that like the problem is, is that if you consent to puberty blockers, you're essentially the, the, the test for consent to puberty blockers is that the child needs to be aware of what cross sex hormones are going to do, and what surgery is going to do, because they seem to all come together. And it never seems to be that it's just that. Whereas I would say, the decision about who can consent to puberty blockers is are you aware of what the puberty block is going to do not about what are you aware of what cross-sex hormones might do in four years time if you take them or what what are you aware if you get a vagina in 10 years time do you know what i mean what is the age limit for cross cross short hormone treatment at the moment so in yeah in uh, england and wales it's 16 um you can't through the gender identity development service you can't access cross-sex hormones so testosterone for trans masculine and trans boys and for trans feminine people and trans girls, it's um, obviously estrogen. Uh, yeah, you, you can't access those until you're 16 and you have to have been on blockers for a year, um, even if you're over 16. So if, so there, there's, a, there's plenty that's actually not that great about trans healthcare in the UK. For example, if you're 16 years old, it's highly likely you'll have gone through most of your puberty. Like it's kind of too late for blockers, but at the moment you still have to have that hurdle of being on blockers for a year before you can go on to cross sex hormones. So if you get to that point at 16 and they give you finally get to the point of getting blockers, you um you won't get cross sex hormones till you're 17. But the youngest possible age is 16. And I want to know your position finally on I suppose the broader political legal legal issue which is developing around trans kids healthcare it's become sort of one of the totemic issues um especially sort of in the culture wars and i suppose what i want to know is you know is there any reasonable questions that are being asked i suppose what what an onlooker looks at and says oh maybe there are a lot of unknowns it does seem like a, a complex issue with lots of gray areas do you look at the debates happening and and sometimes recognize that yes there, there are gray areas there's things we're going to learn about when 
kids should be prescribed puberty blockers and when they shouldn't? Or do you think this is basically all just a reactionary backlash by some anti-trans bigots? Um, and, you know, this whole idea that this is a complicated issue is kind of missing the point. So there's two things. I think sometimes we're tagging things as complicated um, has this effect of like, uh, yeah, tagging it as uniquely difficult and uniquely strange. Actually, child healthcare medicine is very complex as an area. It's complex in all sorts of ways, like um, end of life decisions, um, reproductive um, decisions, like in, in cisgender girls, and um, yeah, like abortion for you know minors have all been things that have been tested in in, in case law because they they are complex areas. But it's like the way that trans youth's healthcare is tagged as uniquely so and what i'd say to you about the um are there gray areas of course there are because that's life and every trans person every trans young person has a different story some will be more complex than others um but the reality is is that what's what's being lobbied for in britain right now isn't an acknowledgement of complexity what's actually being lobbied for is blanket bans like there was a lot of celebration of the bell decision and what nhs england did very wrongly and very i believe unethically and harmfully to the young people under its care was to ban blanket ban um, puberty blockers for anyone under 16 in december um as a result of the judgment in bell and i think that was you know considering that that was very disrespectful of the mental health of the, the young people who had been waiting for several years and were, that week were coming up for blockers and suddenly were being told that they couldn't have them after their hopes being built up so that was a, you know that where's where's the nuance there so i would argue that actually what often trans health advocates are arguing for is a nuanced um, approach to care, but that's who, who's who's responsible for care. Like the, the young person themselves should have bodily autonomy. Um, obviously, they have to have informed consent, and things have to be explained to them at the level that they can manage, and that's important. That's an important part. But it, like a child has rights, even you know, even an under eighteen year old has rights to bodily autonomy. Obviously, their parents, which today is what the judgment upheld, is that um, parents can consent and do in all areas of medicine consent on their child's behalf. Um, that's kind of the nature of parental rights too and um and doctors and clinicians it should never be in the hands of the courts it should never be something that should be subject to like blanket restrictions and so i'm pleased today that what's changed is at least an acknowledgement that parents have a role the obviously the issue that i have as someone that like is aware of like the different experiences of trans young people is that all relies on you having the right kind of parents and unfortunately with all lgbt people um sometimes your parents can be the, the biggest bigots of all, unfortunately, um, or the, the least accepting. So it's, you know, practically it's gone back to the position before December, but we're still at a time where a lot of trans young people are experiencing a lot of distress because they're not getting um, support from anyone, including their parents. That was Sean Fay, writer, broadcaster, and author of the upcoming The Transgender Issue. And um, I do recommend reading about that that ruling today. It was led by Jolly on Morm um, at the Good Law Project. And yes, the, the judges have decided that whilst they are, well, I mean, it wasn't, the, the decision wasn't whether or not to overturn the initial decision, but whilst that initial decision to say that young people can't consent to puberty blockers still stands, they are now saying that, yes, but parents can consent for them. Um, so as, as Sean said in that interview, it does put us basically practically in a situation we were in pre-December, which is not ideal, but it was definitely um, a step back, that decision, which was made at the end of last year. Um, there is a super chat, which I think that Aaron wants to respond to, um, but I, I need to get it up in front of me. So this was about so this is from Alexandra Barnes. Um, any comment on letting Peter Singer air awful views on disability in recent interview? Um, I'm disabled, love Navara, but unhappy re-disability representation. Um, and because that was your interview, Aaron, I want to throw, throw to you. Yeah, very happy to answer the question. Uh, thanks as well for, for the super chat. Was it Alexandra? Um, yes, Alexandra Barnes. Yeah. Um, we're talking at the moment to Deepak um, about not only that interview, but also our broader coverage of, of disability issues. And I think it's absolutely correct that we've we've not been anywhere near good enough on the issue. So ultimately, we wanted a bit of a catharsis on that. I think this week uh, we talked to Deepak. We took a bunch of kind of feedback from various uh, people uh, over the last 10 days. Uh, we, we couldn't really act on it because sadly, two of our staff members, I shouldn't laugh, but so far they're OK, touch wood, have got COVID this week. Two other staff are on holiday. Uh, but hopefully we'll see some movement in the next four or five days and have, uh, I, I, when I say productive, I mean, you know, a really positive outcome because for us, this isn't about, you know, uh, trying to oh, make a problem go away. I think all of us knew the minute that came up and there'll be obviously a range of views on 
on who you can and can't interview, what they can say. And I think any journalistic organization will have that. But where, where we all agree is that our coverage of, of, of disability issues has not been anywhere near good enough. Partly that's because of resource constraints. It's, it's hard to commission certain stuff or interview certain people. Uh, on certain issues, that's that's just a fact. But the, the the reality is, Navarro now is in a place where that's that's not as pressing as it was, say, two years ago. But like I say, Alexandra, give us probably a week, and you can hopefully see something you can take a look at, and then again feed back to us. Going to go on to our next story. On Thursday, Ed Miliband gave a speech announcing Labour's post-pandemic climate policy, and the big pledge was on helping to launch an electric car revolution. Policy proposals included interest-free government loans to purchase electric cars, the part financing of free car battery factories by 2025, and accelerating the rollout of charging points, particularly outside of London. Now, we'll discuss those proposals in one moment. First, though, the content of the speech was somewhat overshadowed by an admission from the Shadow Business Secretary that while he was an evangelist for electric cars, he didn't actually own one. Let's take a look. We need an electric car revolution, but it's got to benefit consumers and it's got to benefit manufacturers and not just the richest. And at the moment, the government's announced the ban, the 2030 ban, but it's not stepping up and taking the bold action necessary to make this fair. Now, what does that what does that mean? What are we calling for? Interest free loans, long term interest free loans for consumers so that we can expand access, not just to the richest. A scrappage scheme so that people can trade in their old cars for electric cars. And crucially, and this is a global race, help for our manufacturers to build the gigafactories, the battery factories that are absolutely essential if we're going to tackle our car industry. You know, I believe that the climate transition can create a better country, but it's only going to happen with bold government action. We're not seeing it at the moment. Government needs to step up. I presume you've got one. I haven't yet. It's a work in progress. What? what? I Practice not. what you preach. I, it's a work in progress. I, I, we, we're actually on our way to buying one before uh, lockdown. Uh, it, it is going to happen, I promise you. I, I have bought an electric bike, but it's, it's, it's on its way. So hang on. So you're you're pushing for everyone to have an electric car, and you don't have one yourself. I'm pushing to make it accessible. Look, I'm pushing to make it accessible. It's not I think even accessible I think, to you. But you haven't well, even experienced well, one yourself. I mean, you'd, you'd like to think if you're going to tell us all to get an electric car and encourage the nation to embrace electric cars, you would have trialled it out for some time and, told, and can tell us whether it's any good or not. Well, I've definitely been in an electric car, and and look, it's the way we've got to go. It's it's the way we've got to go for. For climate reasons, this is the point. This change is coming. This change can benefit our country. I want to be part of that change. Look, maybe. But not yet. Just like other consumers, like other consumers, there are barriers and we've got to break down those barriers. That was very awkward. I do find Ed Miliband quite charming in interviews, but I mean, that was a bit of a rookie error. You're going on television to say everyone's getting an electric car and you haven't got one yourself. And that, look, I'm pushing to make it accessible doesn't really add up because the reason electric cars aren't accessible at the moment is for people on low incomes or for people who live in places with few charging stations. Now, Ed Miliband is not on a low income. The average MP gets £70,000 a year. I don't know if it probably goes up for a shadow minister. I'm not 100% sure. Um, and as far as I understand, he lives you know, most of the time in London. So I, I don't know why you would do that interview without first having bought an electric car. Um, Aaron, what, what did you make of that? I have uh, a great deal to say about this, Michael, uh, and it's not it's not it's not all predictable. Like I said, I think Ed is a really affable. He should be in the shadow cabinet. He clearly is passionate about climate. Um, I tweeted the link to the speech that this was basically talking about, and I would implore people watching this to. I think maybe I tweeted it yesterday. You can just find it on my Twitter sort of timeline. A completely vacuous speech about you know climate transition. There was some stuff. Car scrap scrappage, for instance. That was a Labour policy in 2009, right? They were trying to bolster the UK car ownership by saying, well, we'll pay you to get rid of your old car and to get a new one. That is that Again, is that a green policy? Because obviously there's a great deal of emissions that go into manufacturing a car. If you already have a car and they're going to scrap it just so you can get another one, again, you need to think quite significantly about, well, actually, in terms of net emissions, how meaningful is that? Probably not even a particularly green, <laughs> green policy, by the way. The gigafactories thing, a bit more positive because, of course, it, it feeds into industrial policy. But the thing about we want to give people loans to buy electric cars, of all the things that you're willing to give people 0% interest for, 
or low interest for in this country. It's not to go to university. It's not to get a house. It's to buy an electric car. Come on. Right. I think, the, again, like Labour hasn't thought about this policy. If, and I think we should be giving very low rates of interest to small businesses, to, to workers, to start businesses or to buy equity in businesses, to people that want to buy homes, to people that want to get education and through universities. I think it should be free. But in the interim, you should get the interest on those loans basically down to zero. Labour's not talking about any of that. It's saying let's have really low interest on electric cars. Again, not a terrible policy. But for it to be the centerpiece of your sort of climate agenda right now, when you've got Bill Gates, you've got Mark Carney, you know, anybody that pays attention to the financial press knows there's a, a deluge of people in within the elite. James Murdoch has basically had a, a breakdown in relations with his father over climate change. You know, it's clear that there's a there's a the dial is moving on this issue and that Labour in terms of policy actually aren't really keeping up, which is, I think, quite sad. And then in terms of like that actual interview, the, the substance of it, look, the reality is Ed Miliband doesn't need to buy an electric car. Why is that? Like you say, he lives in London. London has great public transport. He probably lives, you know, quite near to where he has to work. Obviously, he's an MP for Doncaster, but for the week he's in, in London, he's near Westminster. You know, is it worth somebody who lives in London zone one or two? Is it worth buying a car? Well, actually, most people don't buy a car because the public transport's really good. Right. So, you know, that would have been a good answer. Well, I don't need to buy one because the public transport's really good. But then, of course, it undermines the whole policy because surely then we should be trying to make rail and buses and cycling infrastructure better as well. That should be the priority rather than vehicles. So I thought in many ways it's kind of belied the vacuity and weakness of Labour's position on climate. I thought it was very much a Gordon Brown policy because it's about how do we recalibrate consumer demand to affect behavioral change rather than look. The government, the state needs to come in, needs to decarbonize big parts of the economy. Here's how, right? Again, going back to Bill Gates, people might not like me talking about Bill Gates and these glowing you know, tones. I've reviewed his book for Navarra Media. And I think he's wrong about a great deal of stuff. But where he's really, really useful is at the top of the book. I think it's 51 or 53 billion, um, 53 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions are discharged into the atmosphere every year, 53 billion. Right. And, and if you're serious about decarbonizing, the big question is, doesn't matter if you believe the market's going to do it, doesn't you know, matter if you think it's going to require states, whatever, led by China, the EU, whatever. How do you get that 53 billion figure down to zero? That's the big question. How do you do it and how can you do it quickly? And, and I just feel like that level of serious thinking, which you're seeing with somebody like Bill Gates, isn't there with the Labour Party. What makes it more tragic is that we did have a 2019 manifesto. I sincerely think the 2019 manifesto was the most concrete, coherent effort at actually engaging with the problem of climate change by a major political party anywhere in the global north. And it's terrible that that's been discarded and kind of renounced by the, by the party. It's a real shame. Uh, and so, yes, it may seem strange that you know, on the face of it, this is an OK Labour policy. It's not a bad policy, necessarily. I think it betokens a much deeper problem uh, and an inability, fundamentally, to actually talk about climate any longer in a meaningful sense. Mm, I mean, I think we agree that there could have been a lot more in this speech and there could have been a, a more, you know, a bolder announcement than this one on cars. I, I suppose to defend the policy itself, though, there's a couple of things I'd say, which is one, interest-free loans for electric cars isn't just boosting consumer demand that is also a form of industrial policy right because if you're if you're giving people the money to buy or giving people the loans to buy those electric cars that is going to benefit the electric car industry so so that does give uh, an advantage to those companies which should help and um, boost uh, a domestic car industry one would hope and um, although i suppose they could all be imported that's why you might want more direct industrial policy the second is that i agree your focus on public transport works in urban centers and ed miliband could have said yeah the reason i don't have one is because i don't need to because i live in london i mean he also part lives in doncaster presumably because that's his his parliamentary constituency and presumably he also has a car it's just petrol fueled but i think probably electric cars will get us some of the way they will need to be there because when it comes to people who live in rural areas public transport probably isn't the most efficient way to get people around if you have an electric if you you know if you don't live near many people then having a bus come like through twice a day yeah for for equity reasons that's important in different places but people are going to want to drive because that's more convenient when you live in a rural area and so probably you do want to subsidize them buying electric cars no I, I personally think, I mean, first of all, I think 
more than 50 percent of the, the population in this country lives in urbanized areas i don't know the exact number it's more than 60 percent it's probably about 65 70 percent maybe more but clearly the vast majority of people don't live in rurally isolated communities of course that's a very important point michael and actually of course you, you're going to want cars it's one of my sort of one of my criticisms of people that say the public transport stuff well i say well look you know we're an aging population you have people with disabilities if if there's a single mum and she's got three kids and she wants to go to the shops right to do the the the, the, the grocery shopping she wants a car she doesn't want to do that on a bus believe me so i i think that's a really important point but the reality is we uh, as a society can't view this as an issue where we have a one-to-one -one exchange of hydrocarbon cars for electric cars that is not going to work and what's more it's not a smart you know way of operating because the average car today is stationary it's not being used 95 percent of the time now wh where else would you buy something for tens of thousands of pounds it immediately loses value and you won't use it 95 percent of the time and nobody else can use it where else do you find that and so I think, yes, of course, it's part of the it's part of the solution, but it's actually only a small part of the solution. I think realistically, private car ownership is 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 going to have to diminish quite significantly. And that's not because we're going to tell people to stop driving. I think we have to make public transport and other forms of transport more appealing because there's many things about having a car which aren't appealing, Michael. They're expensive. They're they're expensive to run. There's the tax. There's the insurance. There's the maintenance. You know, so. I think most people would far rather use public transport more frequently than they do, but it's just not there yet. And then there's a whole other issue which Labour aren't even talking about, which for me is actually the most exciting part of kind of post-carbon transport, which is micro-mobility. So yes, bikes, but also electric bikes, electric scooters. And again, if we're going to have cities and towns replete with bicycle lanes, which we're going to need, by the way, all of those all of those vehicles can go there. Again, it's really exciting. And I, I I feel like, you know, sometimes you'll listen to a podcast with like, you know, Tyler Brulé and Monocle magazine or the FT, and they talk about micro mobility and, and how we can design cities in a different way. And yet we aren't hearing that from the Labour Party. We're hearing, I think, actually, the recycling of a policy, like I said, from Gordon Brown 2009. The technology's moved on, so it's a bit more interesting. But the car scrappage scheme was something that they were talking about 12, 13 years ago. And that's my concern, Michael. And, 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 and we need to be very upfront about it. Electric cars are great because they're going to get cheaper every year for the rest of your life. That's what there is no argument for, for, for petrol cars. None at all. But realistically, we, we, we want fewer cars. You know, in, in, in LA, the average person in LA spends five days a year in traffic jams. That's not a smart way to run society. That's a very suboptimal way to run society. I think Amsterdam, I think Copenhagen. Uh, I think Malmo, Stockholm have much better, you know, transport systems. And so, yes, of course, it's about technological change, but it's also about the built environment and urban design. And again, you know, Labour can't cower from these things. Those were exactly the kinds of debates which Corbyn from 2015 to 2019 was starting and often winning. Big public debates about, you know, big issues for the next 10, 20, 30 years. Labour have stopped doing that. Mm. I mean, they do have a good story to tell on one area of public transport, though, because we have heard in the last 24 hours that Manchester are bringing their bus service back into public ownership. And I have to admit, I'm a bit ashamed of this because when I read the BBC story here, I, I found out that this is the first area outside of London to have a regulated bus system since 1980s, since the 1980s. And I didn't know that because, I mean, maybe it's probably because I don't leave London enough, but that's completely nonsensical. I mean, that just shows you how extreme neoliberalism was in this country, whereby you've got a system. I mean, the bus system is like a natural monopoly. You really don't need buses competing with each other. Yet in every single town and city in Britain, other than London, that's been happening for the last 40 years. I remember the first time I went to Manchester, I remember the, like you have all of these different buses going down the same route with different prices to get on them. You're like, this is chaos. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And that has been the norm across the country other than in London for 40 years. Um, could this be a turning of the tide? Aaron? For me, oh, it's huge, isn't it? I mean, again, you know, it's one of those stories which, yeah, it wasn't the major story of the day. You know, if you're not in Manchester, you're not going to really, not going to change anything. But it's huge. You know, Manchester is a big, big city. You know, it's effectively the capital of the north in many ways. I mean, that's got downsides as well. You know, the idea that basically let's try and create a little mini London outside of London. But that, that's kind of what, you know, the, the whole... 
you know, the Northern Powerhouse discourse and so on, for all its failings, that's what Manchester is, you know, being set up as. And if this works in, in Manchester, then of course, I think, you know, in Leeds, in, in Liverpool, right across the north of England, but also, you know, other parts of the country too, that's going to be, you know, a major thing. It's similar, in, you know, with it's Scotland. The SNP are bringing ScotRail into public ownership. You know, there is definitely percolating from the bottom up, uh, you know, a drive to to different kinds of public services. And in, and in transport, this is obviously the best example. And I, I think you're right, Michael. If, if TfL didn't exist, I don't think this would be happening. But because there's this obvious template of something, which is just so much better than what you've got in the rest of the country, people go, why don't we do that? And so often, you know, when people talk about local government, oh, well, you can't change anything. You need national power, yada, yada, yada. Sometimes true. But actually, a prototype, a template, is a really powerful thing, and it, it can be imitated by others elsewhere. And this is something which is happening, you know, across the country. There's really exciting stuff happening at a local level, whether it's the Preston model, whether it's uh, South Ayrshire in Scotland, whether it's Passive House. I mean, again, how many people know about this? Passive House is, you know, very low energy uh, housing being built by Exeter Council, 500 units over five years. They've got their own in-house social housing building company. Isn't that brilliant? You know, there's lots of this stuff happening. And I think, you know, that that's one example of it. And you can see how in, you know, 10 to 15 years, you have a very different kind of politics at a national level. But yeah, amazing. I mean, Christ, anybody who gets on buses in this country outside of London knows the system doesn't work. It's common sense. This shouldn't be a Labour thing, you know. I wouldn't be surprised if you get Tory Tory politicians in in a couple of years jumping on it. Mm. I mean, getting I mean, everyone quite likes public transport in London. I mean, it it could be could be less busy it could be cheaper but i mean it it functions quite well and we're going to go straight on to our next story the introduction in parliament of the police and crime bill has set up the year's first big struggle between protesters and the state since the bill's second reading demonstrations have flared up across the country most notably in bristol where on sunday clashes between protesters and the police developed into a mini riot on Tuesday, there was another protest in Bristol against the bill, which was violently repressed. Now, the protest on Tuesday was focusing specifically um, on the aspect of the police and crime bill, which would affect Gypsy, Roma and Traveller communities. The bill, if it passes, would make residing on land in a vehicle without consent a new offence and would strengthen existing police powers to remove people from unauthorised encampments. Now, earlier today, I spoke to Nienta, a member of the GRT community who was at the protest on Tuesday. She explained why the police and crime bill is so frightening. So why is the police and bill direct threat to GRT communities? Um, well, I'm going to read uh, from the bill itself. Um, unauthorised encampments can create significant challenges for local authorities and cause distress and misery to who to those who live nearby. Obviously, they're talking about travellers and so I guess talking about me and my family um, I'd like to think that I don't ever cause distress or misery to anyone I live near. This is directly going to affect our communities if police are given the powers to take away our homes. Um, it seems absolutely mental that this is even being considered to be honest. Um, I've lived this way since I was two um, and I know so many families that live this way. If they get their homes taken off, taken off of them, then where are those families going to go? Um, uh, this, yeah, it's just absolutely mental. Um, we can also face anyone caught uh, trespassing, which is obviously another uh, part of all of this. Um, if they're found guilty of trespass, then we can also uh, get fines of up to £2,500 or serve three months in jail, which is just insane. Um, but also, you know, they're, they're putting into place all, the, all of these things um, to get rid of encampments, um, which these encampments are people's homes, their families, their communities. Um, but also they're not giving us anywhere else to go. So what are they expecting us to to do if they take our homes from us we will be homeless they're just making it extremely hard to live this way um uh and it's just an awful attack on the our communities our lives you know it's it's not just criminals here it's people's it's just mental it's just families it's like just like everybody else but we just choose to live in a caravan or a van or you know a boat or kind of whatever you want to live in this is a, a maybe slightly freer life and we're being penalized for that 
So you can see there are all, all the problems with this bill, why there is an enormous reason and motivation for people, especially from the GRT community, to go out and protest against this bill. That means you might have thought that on Tuesday, and when protesters in Bristol went out to, to raise awareness about these features of the police and crime bill, the police might have managed it sensitively. They did not. This is Nienta again. It was about tw 10 o'clock that the helicopter circled over. Um, and then within four minutes, we had hundreds of riot officers bashing us, bashing us with shields, um, pinning people to the floor, grabbing people's face masks off their face, grabbing people by their scarves, pulling them closer, telling them to get back, uh, which obviously is impossible if somebody's holding you by the scarf. Um, but they came in onto a group of peaceful peaceful protesters. We were all sat on the floor. People had their arms up saying peace as they descended. Uh, my friends just got absolutely trampled. Uh, my mum was there. She was celebrating her 52nd birthday um, and I've never heard her so scared. Uh, I saw my close, close family members get absolutely brutally battered with shields um, and the, it was absolutely, it's just absolutely awful that they can treat people that way and that that's meant to be lawful. Oh, I just can't, I can't, um, that's quite difficult to, difficult to think about. We got kind of pushed back into this little side road. Um, some people managed to get back to the original um, protest spot and after being completely battered by riot police dogs horses there was a helicopter there were drones like it was so so excessive for the like 130 to 200 peaceful protesters that were actually sat there um uh yeah so some pro protesters managed to even get back and do a litter pick all crying their eyes out because they've just been attacked and still managing to keep that keep the litter clear and make sure that we're leaving the land as we've used it completely outrageous to treat people who are already being marginalized by the law and then when they're you know demonstrating using their, their legal right to protest obviously you know the coronavirus restrictions do change things slightly but the the behavior of the police in response to that protest seems actually even more outrageous than the behavior on on the sunday i presume there were people within the police force who wanted to take out um, their anger on protesters because of what had happened um on on sunday which is obviously in no way a justification and is i mean that's precisely what the police should not be doing um taking out their you know frustrations um on on members of the public now we've had an update on the fallout from sunday's protest in the last 24 hours um, you might remember it was widely reported that police officers suffered from broken bones and even punctured lungs now that came from avon and somerset police they said in a press release on monday that a total of 20 officers were assaulted or injured and two of them were taken to hospital after suffering broken bones one of them also suffered a punctured lung which sounds terrible right unsurprisingly these claims were repeated on the bbc so we've got here bbc breaking news police officers suffer suspected broken bones as kill the bill protests turn violent in bristol at least they put suspected but you know what most people will, will think when they when they read that um that particular tweet was it's in fact boosted um by labor's mp for bristol west fangham debonair um she quote tweeted um, and said, this is absolutely unacceptable. The scenes of violence and direct attack on the police in Bristol city centre will distress most people, including anyone who believes in defending the right to peaceful democratic protest. Um, when I checked this afternoon, that was still um, Debonair's pinned tweet. Now, it turns out the claim by the police wasn't true. So on Wednesday, and obviously this was much less publicised than the statement on Monday, Avon and Somerset police released this update. Um, so they say, thankfully, following a full medical assessment of the two officers taken to hospital, neither were found to have suffered confirmed broken bones. At a press briefing that same day, the head of the police also admitted that no officer had in fact suffered from a punctured lung. Now, obviously, it's good news when anyone hasn't got a broken bone or hasn't got a punctured lung. But you do have to ask, why are the statements released by the police so far from reality? And why do they get reproduced by both the mainstream media and by supposedly progressive politicians without much question. Um, Aaron, we have seen this before. The police often exaggerate injuries to demonize protesters. They've done it again and probably once again, they'll get away with it. 
they will get away with it. And it's not an accident. You know, I don't know about now, but when Mark Duggan was murdered by the police, uh, I should say, he was killed by the police. Obviously, that was he was found not to have been murdered. My apologies. Uh, when he was killed by the police, lawfully, it was found, um, there were, I believe at the time, about 70 press officers working for the Metropolitan Police Service. 70. Now, of course, there's been, you know, um, austerity since then. Maybe the number's been cut down. 70 press officers means you can shape reality. They have connections and contacts with every influential journalist, every reporter, think tanker, politician, councillor, MP. I mean, it's a it's a it's an incredibly powerful organization to deal with. No political party has 70 press officers working for it. That's obviously the Met. Bristol's a bit different, but the, the structure the structure remains the same. And, and what I find interesting is the BBC style guide used to be, again, I don't know if it still is, it used to be that to if you were gonna cover a story, not tweet about a story, to actually write the story down, you needed two independent sources, unless it was, you know, Reuters or the Press Association. Right, then it could be just one, but generally speaking, you needed two independent sources. Who are the two independent sources in this story here? It's a really important question, mm. and and again, you know, and and the BBC. This was also a, a BBC piece, but what you often see is a BBC journalist will tweet something again with just one particular source. Often, somebody WhatsApping them. You know, are we going to be in a system where the police can get away with clear uh, attacks on civil liberties and freedoms? Because somebody that works in the police can WhatsApp a journalist. You know, it's a really troubling, troubling thought. And it's not about a cab or anything like that. A, a real journalist should be just as skeptical of what the police say as anybody else, right? That, I mean, that's the point. And that's why you that's why you had the style guide of two independent sources. Uh, it's there for a reason. Uh, you want to get to the truth. You're going to need multiple people, you know, asserting the same point, independent of one another. Yeah, and the police, the police lie. To an extraordinary extent, I've seen this. I've seen this myself. I've been, I've been in a court on the day a police was about to perjure himself on the stand to make something up about me and a, a, a friend, and some video evidence came to light. We we knew it was there, but obviously we submitted it that morning, and he then didn't he didn't uh, take the stand and didn't say all the lies he was going to say. And the person I was alongside, he would have been deported for that. He would have had his life turned upside down for no particular reason. I, I have no idea why people, if you have even the, the, the slightest engagement with somebody like that, why would you trust the police? Crap, you know, ridiculous. Really, really ridiculous. Of course, you know, I understand they're an arm of the state. That's fine. But that's why you need all these mechanisms to, to ensure that journalists are skeptical and that we hold them to account and that if they do lie, there are consequences. None of that appears to happen, though. Hmm. No, I think that's also true. I mean, you say, why would you believe them? This is one of those issues where there is a real divide in society between people whose contact with the police is generally positive and people whose contact with the police is generally negative. So there'll be, you know, the way these statements will be read by different parts of society will be, you know, complete opposite. And we're going to go on to our last story now, um, which is a silly one to end, to end our Friday night show. On Thursday, Parliament voted to extend the government's coronavirus powers for another six months. The vote itself was fairly uneventful, with the government winning 484 votes to 76 votes for the extension. However, in the debate, there was one memorable moment. It came from the Conservative MP for Broxbourne, Charles Walker. Let's take a look. I'm not here to talk about eggs, Madam Deputy Speaker. I want to talk about milk. Because in the remaining days of this lockdown, I am going to allow myself an act of defiance, my own protest that others may join me in. I am going to protest about the price of milk, Madam Deputy Speaker. Now, I'm not sure whether I think the price is too high or the price is too low. I shall come to that decision later. But for the next few days, I am going to walk around London with a pint of milk on my person because that pint will represent my protest. And there may be others who will choose to, to walk around London with a pint of milk on their person as well. And perhaps as we walk past each other in the street, our eyes might meet, we might even stop for a chat. But I was thinking to myself, and I will continue to think to myself, what will their pint of milk represent? What will their protest be? Perhaps they will be protesting the roaring back 
of a mental health demon brought on by lockdown. Perhaps they will be protesting a renewed battle with anorexia, with depression, with anxiety, with addiction. Perhaps with their pint of milk, they will be protesting the lack of agency in their life, not being able to make a, a meaningful decision. Maybe a loss of career or job or business. Maybe they will be protesting this country's slide into authoritarianism, or perhaps they'll be protesting the fact that we allow unelected officials to have lecterns at number 10 to lecture us how to live our lives. Yeah. There's lots to talk about there. We'll get onto the milk bit in an issue. First of all, I mean, obviously he's there. He's making a speech against the extension of lockdown restrictions. He's going to do a protest to protest i suppose against those lockdown restrictions with a pint of milk again we'll get onto that in a moment what really struck me there was actually not what he said but the cheers in in the rest of the house of commons because you'll know he talked a lot about there you know the mental health effects of lockdown etc cetera, etc cetera. the room was fairly silent the thing that really animated all the conservatives in that chamber was him saying he was really annoyed that you had experts standing at lectern speaking to the public these, these conservative MPs, especially the extreme backbench ones, they really hate having actual scientists being able to speak with a louder voice than them. Because what they would have done over the last 12 months is have these, you know, bananas herd immunity theories. So let's do what Sweden done. Um, and then we would have looked back and we would have had even, even more deaths than we had. Because they hate the fact that you have this body called SAGE and then they announce what the scientific consensus is. Because it seems... You know, they can't control it. I mean, we've often talked in on this show about how the scientific advisors haven't always been critical enough or, or loud enough um, in contrast to the government. But these guys want them to be even, even quieter. Um, let's get on to the milk. I mean, I assume I, I, I assume he's just chosen it because it's an arbitrary object. You're saying I'm I'm I, I'm not protesting anything in particular. My protest is purely about protest itself. That's why he says, I might be arguing it's too expensive or too cheap or I can't quite remember. It also um, gave him an arbitrary object um, to walk around TV studios and TV interviews with. Um, after that debate, um, he spoke to ITV. Let's take a look. Well, the pint of milk is going to remind me, because I spoke about it in the chamber today, that the act of protest is now a freedom, not a right. And from now forevermore, when I look at a pint of milk or a glass of milk on a table, I will remember that protest is a freedom and freedoms need to be cherished and fought for every day, lest you lose them and have them taken away. So it's a sort of a memory aid as to what I need to do over the remainder of my life. Well, what is at stake is I think our freedoms are still in danger and are still being restricted. Uh, the government has said that we only want to keep this act around for another six months. But as I said in my speech, as sure as eggs is eggs, I hadn't moved on to milk by then, that we will be back at the end of September and the government will be saying, well, you know, it's the autumn months now, we're moving into winter, we'll need these powers for, a, for another six months and we will have exactly the same debate and Labour will once again support the government and we will have another six months after the next six, after the current six months of restrictions. So we are looking at being in restriction, having our liberties constrained for at least another 12 months. Now, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the concrete issue about whether or not we should be concerned about certain aspects of the extension of the, the Coronavirus Act. First of all, Aaron, what do you make of the milk stunt? He's really milking it. I think he's uh, he's taking us. <laughs> uh, it, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, it's interesting. Uh, the, the point about all these people are unelected. You know, we didn't elect them. They made these massive decisions over our lives. Hello, have you heard of the Bank of England? Have you heard of the Ooh. governor of the Bank of England? They're not elected. They make really big decisions about you know interest rates. You know, really huge decisions. You've been fine with that for twenty five years. You're fine with a, a bunch of really powerful unelected people in society. I would prefer a scientist making decisions over public health rather than Rupert Murdoch effectively telling people what to think. Or, uh, or well, they don't uh, even or, make the decisions. They're they're quite clear. We advise drive the, the decisions. Decide. What, yeah. what drive he's decisions. pissed off That's about his representation, is precisely. Though, isn't it? But no, but his representation, what he's specifically annoyed about isn't that they, well, I mean, he probably is also annoyed about the fact that they influence public policy. The thing he really hates, though, is that they speak to the public. He's like, it should be 
my, I should be able to represent my balmy views about science however I want, and there should be no one to contradict me. Because he knows that if it weren't for the scientific advisors, then the mouthpieces would just be the Murdoch press. There wouldn't be anything to push back against it. And he can construct reality to, to be whatever shape he wants. And he hates the fact that there's an independent authority which has direct contact with the public, which he can't control. I mean, that was, that was what I took from it. No, I agree with you. I, Michael, I agree with you in, 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 uh, entirely. But I just think, firstly, you know, Tories, the unelected mm. authority, because there is a certain appeal to civil liberties and freedoms. Obviously, this is ridiculous which I, th I think, you know, historically, some conservatives have got right. I no to ID cards, right? Um, extraordinary rendition, stuff like that. They're on the right side of a lot of that debate, I think, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And I, I can understand he comes out of that. I mean, this is bizarre. This is obviously ridiculous. But those are the things he's, he's, he's trying to appeal to. But you're right. I think, for me, this reflects a kind of idea of freedom and of interdependence and of liberty, which is a right-wing libertarian idea of liberty, which... Is just it's always been obviously flawed, but it just makes absolutely no sense in the 21st century. You know, we are we are so interdependent, so connected. The idea that somebody can just go and do what they want in the middle of a pandemic is 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 clearly you know not good, probably not safe. And socialists do have an understanding of freedom, which is you know freedoms obviously are to an extent contingent, and also we recognise we're part of a broader social system that obviously should help us flourish, but also we need to subordinate our interests to the collective interest. For a conservative, that's much harder. And so for this kind of, this Thatcherite libertarian idea of freedom, you know, it's it's coming up against reality. And it's very hard for them, Michael. It is incredibly hard for them, you know, and it's also an, it's an age divide as well as an ideological one. One maps onto the other. You know, younger people are perfectly happy to say, I will happily renounce these freedoms in order to achieve X, Y, Z, whether it's climate change, whether it's the pandemic, uh, and then that's you know, and and for these guys that come out of the eighties, they 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 they've never seen this before. It's anathema to them. Oh, constraints on what I can do. Of course, of course, someone like him is privileged enough to only have to protest about protest. What was he gonna? Was he gonna protest about housing? Was he gonna protest about having bad you know a bad job with bad wages, not having a health um, you know pension or sick pay or holiday pay? No, he didn't have to protest about any of that stuff because his life was cushy. But he's gonna protest about protests. Good luck. Good luck to him. He looks ridiculous. Uh, ultimately, this is the stuff that we'll be la we'll be laughing about in, tw in 20, 25 years' time. This is the century of, you know, really critical questions about um, demographic aging, about climate change, about, you know, artificial intelligence, about, you know, the, the demise of the West contra the, the, the rest. Huge, big geopolitical, technological, political questions. And Tories are walking around with pints of milk, Michael. You know... <laughs> We are looking at the ancien regime. Uh, so, like I say, good luck to him. Mm. I mean, it would be interesting. It was one of the sort of TV hosts should have asked him, have you ever been on a protest? Because I think you, I can't imagine what he would have gone out to, to protest. And I mean, it is, it is also quite grotesque, the fact that all of these Tory backbenchers have suddenly reinvented themselves as really, really caring about mental health problems and anorexia after they've sat on those Tory benches and voted for cuts to mental health services mm -hmm. For, for a decade, and actually not just cuts to mental health services, because it's also the cuts which weren't related to the mental health services, which have driven people into having ill mental health. You know, because the benefit system is being the prime example. Yeah. It doesn't cost anything. So, I mean, you, you say, we need to, let's, we all need to talk about mental health. It's so important. I mean, yeah, okay. But it, but the point is, you can do that. It doesn't cost anything. So the Tories love it. We all need to really start talking about mental health. You know what really will help people's mental health in this country? Not having to give 60% of their wage at the end of the week to a landlord. Not having mm. to basically, when every every time they go to check their bank balance, know that it could be a bad story, or be worried when they pay for something, there's not going to be enough uh, cash in their account to pay for it. That helps. Believe me, that's a far better way of dealing with people's mental health than, uh, oh, we all need to talk about it. Yes, you know, it's not all economic. Yes, there are people that suffer from anxiety, depression, a range of conditions, uh, which have, you know, uh, you know, they're very affluent people. True. Uh, but like you say, Michael, it really does speak to a kind of, a bit of a double standard here. Who, who's that? Who's that government? Who's that influencer? Who's now like, you know, he's now Boris Johnson's go-to guy on mental health. Alex, something the doctor. Oh, Doctor Alex from Love Island. Yeah, and how he's now set up. Um, uh, what's that thing called? Uh, this is where I lose my, uh, you know, my coherence. He set up that thing, you know, where you you give <laughs> you're, you're money you give, towards pop culture, and it's sort of you, slipping you, away from your. No, grip. it's really it's really new. It's uh, you know, you give money to something, and then they. 
and you get to see their exclusive content. What's it called? People in the comments. Oh, OnlyFans, OnlyFans. Yeah, he's just OnlyFans. got an OnlyFans account, which he was an only as being for pornography, but his is just about mental health oh, whatever. and the government. Oh, whatever. Yeah, it's like, follow my OnlyFans. And this is like, this is the government's guru on mental health, for, you know, for exclusive mental health content on my OnlyFans. Oh, my God. <laughs> what? What? We, you know, we had the technology to probably reverse aging within 20, 30 years. Uh, we can build general purpose artificial intelligence this century. But we have a crap, a crap society, let's be real, a crap, crummy, shitty society, which is falling so far below what it could potentially be that actually when it comes to mental health and depression is going to be the world's number one cause of, of, of the, the disease burden by, I think, 2035. And we're talking about, you know, an OnlyFans and, and opening up about mental health problems. Really? And walking oh, around London with a pint of milk. Yeah, a crummy, we are a crummy civilization right now. We could be doing so much better. Also, I'd say Charles Walker. Have I got his name right? It is Charles Walker, isn't it? It's, yeah, Charles Walker, exactly. I, should, I don't know why I doubted myself. If you really think that, you know, ending lockdown, well, I mean, we are coming out of it now quite rightly, but if you think that lockdown was a net detriment to mental health, then you should really speak to some doctors and nurses who are already suffering from PTSD. You know, if we'd gone into lockdown earlier in December and they didn't have to treat you know, over 30,000 people at, at one time in hospital, then probably there would be a lot fewer people with PTSD in this country. Um, anyway, let's wrap up there. We got a final comment. This is from Sean Mark with 20 euros. Thank you very much. Michael, could you please give a big shout out to my sister and Tisky comrade Leanna Mark, who absolutely smashed her PhD viva today with zero corrections. I'm so proud. If anyone needs a doctor of ethical metalepsis, hmm, look no further. I'll have to look up what metalepsis is before I work out when I will need to look it up. Aaron, do you know what metalepsis is? No. I'm looking at it now as a reference in which phrase or word taken from figurative speech is employed in a new context. But you you have taught me a new word. Thank you very much. <laughs> and and con congratulations on the Viber today. Um, yep, congratulations on that, Viva. Thank you, everyone, for your super chats tonight. Um, apologies if I didn't get time to read them all out. They would have popped up um, on the screen. Um, as ever, thank you so much. If you are a regular supporter to Navara Media, you make this whole thing possible. If not, please do go to navaramedia.com forward slash support and donate the equivalent of one hour's wage a month. Um, have a great, if low-key, weekend. We'll be back on Monday at 7 p.m. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. For now, you've been watching Tisky Sour on Navarra Media. Good night.